Hello all, good evening. Uh, I'm Jay Prasurindran. I'm web services engineer at Cloudflare. Um, uh, like it's been uh, one year since I started using Go. So uh, I recently came across this uh, probabilistic data structures and I thought, okay, let me explore a little bit and share what I learned. Uh, so how many of you have already heard about probabilistic data, heard or used probabilistic data? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good amount. So uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, give an introduction to probabilistic data structures and go over uh, uh, pretty famous probabilistic data structures like Bloom filters, Countman sketch in hyperloglog, along with the use cases. And I'm going to show you a demo uh, where we analyze the memory usage uh, by the conventional hash map and in comparison with our probabilistic data structures and uh, conclude with the key takeaways. So uh, probabilistic data structures, they just store the summary of the data instead of storing the actual data. So they're also called as sketching data structures because they are more or less like a sketch. Like when you do a sketch, it's not super uh, thorough, but you do a sketch. So they are called probabilistic data structures as sketching data structure because they store a summary of the data instead of storing the actual data. So the use case for this uh, uh, these data structures is usually when you're trying to uh, compute some uh, or process big data, like which doesn't usually fit your memory RAM space. So uh, when you try to optimize for space and when you look for space constraint algorithms, that's when the probabilistic data structures come into picture. So they are approximate, so they come with a cost. So you trade accuracy for space. So you, we can configure how much uh, 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 accuracy, uh, like how much error, pro like how much percentage of error we can tolerate. So these are the use cases. So the, the data structures, which I'm going to discuss, which they can be used for these use cases, one of these use cases, uh, either membership check or frequency check, distinct count check. So the example which I'm going to show in my demo today is like uh, I took a, a web server log and just extracted the IP before addresses from those logs. And the membership check is like is to check whether the given IP is present in that set or not. And the frequency check is to check like is to uh, see like okay, how many requests came from this specific IP? So that's the use case like to uh, to find out the frequency check and the distinct count. Okay, how many unique IPs try to reach my site or whatever? So these are the typical use cases. Um, and yeah, so and other real world scenarios where they actually use these sort of data structures, they are extensively used in uh, in many use cases. Like uh, one is uh, cache optimization. So one of the surveys by the CDN company, they told like, uh, so typically when you cache a request the first time you see it, and most of the time they are one hit wonders. Like user may request the data for the first time and they may not at all request it for the second time. So this is what they term as one hit wonders. So uh, a, a survey by a CDN company, they told like three fourth of the requests which they cached in their CDNs are one hit wonders. And they have to process them, the, the cache purging and eviction, it adds unnecessary complexity. So instead of uh, uh, caching the data, whenever we see them for the first time, the alternate approach is to use bloom filters. So uh, I'll explain it later. So uh, just uh, uh, log them in your Bloom filter, and when you see the request for the second time, then you go and cache your information. And URL shortness, you are, typically we, we compute some hash and then trim that hash to compute our URL shortness. If that is all that hash value is already generated, then instead of going to database and hitting a constraint error and then regenerate a new hash, you can use a uh, Bloom filter to uh, uh, check on the client side uh, and avoid unnecessary IO cost. And web browsers to, uh, to check uh, the blacklisted IPs or uh, URLs uh, in the client side before even uh, going to the server. And in general, to reduce the DB lookups in Postgres, Bigtable, HBase, Cassandra, they all use uh, Bloom filter for this. And type ahead search, filtering fields, these are some of the real world use cases where they use these sort of data structures. Um, 
Yeah, so Bloom filter is a highly efficient uh, probabilistic data structure that is used to check whether a member is part of a set or not. So in this data structure, false positives are uh, feasible, but not false negatives. So uh, you go to a Bloom filter and you ask, hey, whether this value is present, the response from the Bloom filter will be either a definite S, or it will be maybe S or definite no. So there is a possibility that Bloom filter may give you a positive response, but it may not actually be present in your secondary store. But the other way around, it's not possible. So Bloom filter will never say like, no, it's not present, and the data is actually present in your secondary. So that case is not pos uh, possible. So uh, false positives are present. Uh, like, uh, you can have po false positive response, but not a false negative response. So it will be either possibly in set or definitely not in set. So we just saw it can answer questions like what if a URL is malicious or if, is, if a particular IP address is bl uh, blacklisted or whatever, like if, if a zone ID exists in the database or uh, uh, questions like that. So it typically has two, uh, two operations, uh, add and look up. So the first time it will uh, add the, uh, it will set bits in the Bloom filter and when you do a look up, like, when you do the request for the next time, it will do a lookup in the Bloom filter to give back the response. So you typically allocate a bit array of length m, and you use k hash functions. These are all configurable. The length of the bit array, as well as the number of hash functions you want to compute. And uh, this, you have to configure it uh, for your desired false positive rate. The, if the size of the bit array is large, and if you use more hash functions, then it's more, it's gonna be more accurate. Uh, yeah, this is what we saw. So let's, uh, it's, y you all uh, must be familiar with the hash map. So it's more or less similar to hash map, but uh, hash map does care about collision, but Bloom filter doesn't care about collisions. There may be collisions. Uh, so whenever you get an element, so you apply like, three hash functions. So the, the hash functions may be cryptographic or non-cryptographic. Typically, cryptographic hash functions are slower, so people use non-cryptographic hash functions. And if you want to optimize it further, then you can uh, use one hash function and derive k, split it and derive k functions output. So, um, so let's say this is a Bloom filter. What you do is whenever you get an element, you set a bit for each and every hash function you compute. So compute a hash function, modulo the size of the Bloom filter, and set that bit factor to one. So when you try to check whether the mem do the membership check, an element is present in a set only if all those three indices return back one. If you get zero even for one, uh, one hash function, then you can be sure like it's not present in the set, and you need not proceed further. So these are the three cases which I explained. So you go to Bloom filter and ask like, do you have a key? And one response is, it's gonna be, no, I don't have, which is the definite no. And the two and three, it's like, maybe, like it may be present. So if a Bloom filter responds with, oh, it may be present, then there are two cases. It may be present in the secondary store or it may not be present in the secondary store. But the percentage of this unnecessary access, it's, it's up to you. Like typically it's around like three or four percentage, 95 percentage of the time it's gonna be correct. Uh, if it says yes, it's gonna be present in the secondary store. Uh, benefits and drawbacks, it's, it's more efficient than a hash table or a bit array. If, if this is not even a bit array because it's not linear but sublinear of size M. Say if you have billion elements, the size of the bit array is not going to be billion. It's going to be like it's not going to be billion bits. It's going to be much lesser than that. So that's why I said like it's sublinear memory utilization. That's one of the key benefits. That's what I'm going to show demo as well. Like how much heap space it's taking the conventional hash map and the probabilistic data structures and drawbacks. The basic uh, Bloom filter doesn't uh, support deletes. The, the basic implementation. And it requires a, a priori knowledge of uh, approximately how much elements you are expecting. Uh, because the over provision Bloom filter wa uh, like, uh, wastes space, whereas the under provision Bloom filter increases the error rate. 
there are a lot of other bloom filter variations to uh, cater the needs of people. So like uh, rotating bloom filters or stable bloom filter, cuckoo filter, and which is Murmur hash, which is one of the fastest hashes available. And uh, I'm going to show a demo of uh, how memory efficient it is using Go. Uh, I containerized my application, so. Um, Uh, so I'm using, uh, I did not implement my own version of all these uh, uh, data structures. I'm using the uh, existing implementations available. So um, by default, I'm setting the project as uh, Bloom Filter and the file. So when we run, we can change it in runtime, whatever project we want to use, and when we run, uh, and the file. So. So as we saw, like our input is going to be a list of really large list of IPv4 addresses. Uh, the conventional hash map implementation here, uh, I'm reading the access.log uh, file, which just has the trimmed IPv4 addresses, and scanning the input and inserting it to my hash map. So hash map here. So uh, for beginners, hash map is a like reference type in Go, and it implements the underlying data type. And so at the end of this uh, scan loop, all the IPv4 addresses will be present in our hash map. And then I'm manually running a GC here. Uh, I'm just garbage collecting the memory which is allocated for the scanner or whatever, just to uh, get some uh, accurate uh, memory just, just used for the hash map. So um, runtime.gc, it, it manually does a garbage collection. And runtime.memstats, it has all those memory stats. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, I'm fetching the heap allocation here, uh, runtime.readmemstats, and I'm printing out the heap allocation. This is for a hash map implementation. And then I'm checking, okay, check the hash map, whether the specific IP address is present or not. Uh, so if hash map contains this IP address, then it's gonna return my contain IP address. And if it does not, this is actually accurate. So uh, contains. IP address, and if not, it's it's gonna say no. Uh, I'm doing four such lookups in my hash map, and now let's have a look at the Bloom filter uh, implementation. So uh, I'm initializing a new uh, Bloom filter here. This is the number of expected entries. It it uh, gets two parameters: number of expected entries and the false positive rate tolerance, how much uh, you're tolerable to your error rate. And I'm doing the same operations here: read the access log. Um, get all the IPv4 addresses and uh, put it into your uh, Bloom filter. Now I'm doing uh, same, I'm, I'm garbage collecting here as well, manually uh, trigger those garbage collection and get the memory stats, uh, find out the heap memory allocated uh, for Bloom filter. So let's uh, show a demo here. So take the Docker file in the current directory and build and tag it as go northwest. And So now uh, Docker run, the project is Bloom Filter, and the implementation is Bloom Filter implementation. We have two implementations. The other one is the conventional hash map. Um, I'll do it parallel here, Docker.
it's going to take some time. Yeah, so uh, the conventional hash map, it takes uh, around 473 megabytes uh, heap, heap space, whereas the Bloom filter, it takes seven, seven MB, which is like orders of magnitude lesser than the conventional hash map because uh, it, here it's going like in bloom filter it's maximum of three bits or it's proportional to the number of hash functions you use uh, for each element whereas in a conventional hash map it's going to be um, uh, like four bytes to eight bytes depending depending on the data type which you use which is like 32 to 64 uh, bits uh, uh, so this is uh, this is to show the memory efficiency of bloom filter and the next data structure which uh, we are going to discuss it's countman sketch Uh, countman sketch is a probabilistic data structure as well, but it serves as a frequency table of events. So unlike a Bloom filter, which is a bit uh, bit array, like countman sketch, we are using integer array here, uh, and it acts as a frequency counter. So uh, in Bloom filter, we saw like it's just going to set the bit to one, whereas in countman sketch, the the difference between uh, Bloom filter and countman sketch is that it's going to increment the counter whenever it encounters that element. Um, oh, it's Are you mirroring it, maybe? Okay. Um. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> Whenever I switch tabs, something weird happens. Okay, yeah, how it works. Uh, so similar to uh, Bloom filter here, uh, we have two parameters here. One is width and the other one is depth. So width is going to be the size of your bit array and depth is the number of uh, hash functions you want to use here. Um, so this is also a sublinear space, like this utilizes sublinear space and uh, two dimensions with, with columns and D rows. So the width is gonna be the size and the depth is the number of hash functions and this can be optimized to uh, configure uh, as per your desired error rate. Um, so frequency of the element is the minimum counter value. Uh, why are we going ahead with a minimum counter value? Because there is a chance for collision here. So um, different elements may increment the counter in the same location. So we have depth of four. So whenever we want to get a count of that element, we compute the hash, uh, we apply the four hash functions and get the count and get the minimum of the four counts available just to uh, make sure we are closer to approximate value uh, and uh, uh, ignore the noise caused due to collision. Yeah, why minimum the uh, possibility of collision between the elements and uh, counter may be incremented by multiple elements and greater the, and also greater the width and height, like there's gonna be less collision and higher accuracy. The benefits, it's also sublinear space. Uh, it's, it's not proportional to the number of elements which you are going to process, but much, way lesser than that, super space efficient, and useful for detecting the heavy hitters. Uh, uh, the, uh, the IP, which uh, the, uh, this IP acts as my site, 
the top visitor of my site. So something like that, heavy hitters. And we combine it with Amina Max Heap. It's easy to track the top K elements. So when it comes to cache, if you are implementing a cache, if you want to uh, find out the hot objects, uh, top K hot objects, you can go ahead with this countenance combination of countenance sketch and a heap to implement that. Drawbacks, it's a biased estimator. It, it's, it's, it may over, uh, overestimate, but never underestimates. So due to collisions, you will always get some, uh, it's, there's a possibility of getting a higher value than the actual count, but there's no possibility of, there's n no way for underestimate. So it's, it's slightly biased. So that's the drawback here. And once again, demo. So I'm going to change my project to Countman Sketch here when running my Docker. And this is going to be the conventional hash map <coughs> here. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to uh, get the frequency of specific IP addresses here. So uh, the heap space, uh, conventional hash map takes 592 MB to do the same work, whereas uh, Countman sketch takes 16 MB of space. That is also order of magnitude uh, uh, lesser. And the trade-off is there's, there's going to be a slight uh, difference in the count. So in HashMap, you can say like this val this count is accurate, whereas in um, Countman Sketch, it, you can approximate with like this many uh, er this much percentage of error. So this specific IP, the occurrence is like uh, 110022. The, these num this IP occurred for this many number of times in the access log, uh, whereas here in Countman Sketch, it gives a, s a slightly different value. Here it's 22, whereas it's 28. So that's the uh, tolerance level which I said, like how much uh, uh, approximation you are uh, comfortable with. And if it's not present, it's going to be zero. So for all the counts, if you see, like the hash map count is accurate when actually 1,003 for the second, and here it's 1,006. That's the slight approximation done by the confidence sketch. But this, the heap, uh, the amount of heap space which it's using, it's way, way lesser to accomplish the same task. And the third uh, data structure, third and the last data structure which we are going to discuss today, it's uh, hyperlog log. It's, it's, it's mainly used for uh, counting the distinct elements or cardinality estimation, uh, where, for example, let's say you have a billion values and you want to see uh, 2 billion or 4 billion uh, values or some continuous stream of data and you want to see the unique uh, uh, number of unique elements in stream or the data. So uh, the one thing which comes to our mind is like, once again, put it in a hash set and whenever there is a duplicate, it's automatically going to reject it. And if you see the count of the hash set, it's going to give you the number of unique elements. But uh, when the size of your input is really high, then you're, uh, you're going to get uh, out of memory exceptions because your uh, allocated heap space or the RAM space is going to overflow and it's because it's, it can't uh, store all those in, uh, uh, in the given memories. That's where the hyperlog log comes into picture and, and it usually requires memory proportional to cardinality. Uh, the use cases, for example, how many unique words are used in Wikipedia, or what is the cardinality of a column in databases? So hyperloglog can answer these questions. Um, how it works? So hash an element to an integer and count the number of 
uh, leading zeros in the binary form of that hash and track the highest number of leading zeros before you encounter one. And the cardinality is computed using this formula 2 power n plus 1. So this may seem abstract and funny. The, there's a, uh, there are a couple of good papers which explain the math behind this. Uh, I tried to simplify it and make it as easy as possible. So let's say we have a list with four strings. Uh, what we do, hyperlog does, is it computes a hash for each input string. And uh, so let's say we have four elements, foo bar, uh, and like four, four elements here. So the, ha the corresponding hash values. And we have to find out the maximum number of leading zeros before you encounter a first one in all these input. Here, you, uh, the string two and three, they have one leading zeros before, one leading zero before they encounter a first one. So the formula to compute the cardinality is two power n plus one, which is four. And we have four distinct elements in our stream. That's, that's how, uh, this is the simplest possible example I try to uh, uh, go to, uh, uh, to uh, make you understand how hyperloglog -log works. And now the demo time. Uh, for hyperloglog, -log, this is the conventional hash map implementation. I'm reusing the same thing uh, except for, uh, I'm using, this is for the compa hash map comparison, uh, trying to find the number of unique elements using hash map. So I'm inserting all the elements into hash map, uh, do a uh, garbage collection and check the heap allocation. And in hyperloglog -log implementation, uh, in this implementation, if I do a hyperloglog.new, -log .new, the default size, it, it uh, instantiates a byte array of size 16,384 as per this default implementation. And then when you insert the elements, so we saw like, uh, so if the size is byte uh, 2 power 14, then you need 14 bits to identify a specific location in that byte array. So, um, so the way this implementation works, it takes in a string, computes a 64-bit hash code, and extract the least 14 bits to find uh, an index in that byte array. And in the remaining 50 MSBs, compute the leading number of leading zeros before you encounter a first one, and store those number of leading zeros in that uh, index which you found by taking the least 14 bits. Uh, and after you do this for all the uh, incoming elements, if you uh, traverse that hyperlog log, uh, you're essentially storing the number of leading zeros in hyperlog log, nothing else, for each and every input element you get. And the, um, uh, the, the entry with maximum number of leading zeros, that is what you take as n, and then you apply it to the formula 2 pi n plus 1 to get the cardinality. Um, the demo. This is the hash map implementation to, to uh, get the number of unique elements, unique uh, IPv4 addresses. And Uh, hyperlog -log takes a heap space of 53 KB, <laughs> whereas hash map takes a heap space of 473 MB to calculate the number of uh, unique IPv4 addresses in a given really large list. Um, so the count, if you see, it's uh, the accurate count is 700, whereas it's the last three, it's, it's 854. So with a tolerance of one or two percentage approximation, so uh, we need to configure the approximation, but uh, this is super memory efficient. These are super memory efficient data structures. That's what I wanted to demonstrate, and that, that's what the message I want to convey here by comparing with the conventional data structure which comes to our mind, which is the hash map, and these probabilistic data structures. Of course, these are... Uh, used for specific use cases which are space constrained. So, uh, 
And one final demo, like uh, I'll see uh, if I can show the out of memory uh, thing here with Loom filter. Uh, so here you can give parameters for Docker when you run. So hyphen M is the amount of memory you're allocating, which is 50 MB, and memory swap, which is the swap space, which you can specify when you run. Okay, allocate 50 MB of spa, uh, swap space to Docker, and memory swappiness is whether memory swappiness is allowed or not, whether you can swap the uh, uh, swap pages with disk. So if you make it a zero, it says like don't swap memory. Uh, I'm trying to uh, demo this with uh, bloom filter and hash map. Oh, why is it good? Okay. It's going to take some time. Eventually it's going to get killed, uh, but it's going to, so I'm restricting. So you can, uh, so this is simulating a system like uh, how, when your RAM uh, gets full, you usually get out of memory exception. I'm trying to do that with Docker. Okay, allocate just 50 MB for this Docker. And if the hash map tries to uh, use more memory than that, then it'll be killed with out of memory exception. That's what I'm showing to, uh, trying to show here. Um, so we saw the demo, like the Bloom filter, it was successful with the data and it took uh, just seven MB. In another three or four seconds, we let's see what happens. Uh, so uh, this is a Docker container. I'm taking this ID and inspect. Okay. I'm inspecting this. Docker, which is running here, and checking. So, so now we got a signal saying it got killed. So uh, if I check here now, the reason, yeah, it's the, if we inspect that Docker image, it says like OOM killed, which is like out of, it's killed due to the out of memory. It's set to true. Initially it was set to false, but now it's true. So uh, in conventional hash map, it, it was not able to compute it within the given 50 MB space, so it got killed. Uh, this is what I tried to demo, and yeah, that's that's it. Some references, and thank you all. Thank you.